Oh, yeah, what a night to look at the Milky Way, and but not with this telescope. I can't hardly hold it steady there. Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay star curious today on Backyard Astronomy with the American Space Museum. This refractor telescope is familiar to everybody out there, the little $100 uh, bargain box edition. And uh, we're going to talk about the meteors over the weekend. Maybe you saw a great bolide like this one. Holy cow. That looks like there'd be a giant meteor that crashed in there. No, probably the size of a of maybe a pea or a corn kernel. But uh, most meteors you, may, you saw over the weekend were the size of a grain of sand. I saw a handful. I didn't lay out all night, but uh, long enough just to see a few good Perseid meteor showers in the moonless skies of the weekend and the wheelhouse of August, middle of August. By the way, as I have this there, say hello to Marty Winkle. Hey, there's Marty. How you doing? Doing good, Mark. Yeah. It's like you're doing good. Yeah, I'm feeling good today. Get off to a good week. Uh uh, went out to the Space Center, saw Kathy Thornton. You're going to see her and just a lot of business as usual here at the museum. I uh, wanted to point out, Marty, when you see one of these telescopes like this, if you can make, if it looks kind of a bluish looking lens at the end there, then that's glass with a coating. If it looks milky white, all right, that's plastic. Stay away from it. That looks like at least that has a glass lens in it in there. But you really want to get out under the stars with your binoculars and learn the sky with your binoculars. Get your red flashlight out right there. Why do I need a red flashlight? To read your star chart. All right. And if you had a white light, your eyes would not be seeing all the faint objects as they dilate out and your eye absorbs more light. And it lets more light in. So to read your star charts there, get you a red flashlight. Same kind of principle that photographers used in dark rooms back in the last century, uh, developing black and white film like I did for uh, pay my bills for a living for a dozen years. But uh, so a great time to be out stargazing there's all kinds of uh, objects to see easily in your binoculars star clusters galaxies uh, nebula and all in the milky way we're going to see some pictures of that to get you examples but we've got cygnus the swan overhead hercules which actually hercules kind of looks like spongebob square pants uh, outline a square box uh, you've got um, Sagittarius, uh, Scorpius are all in the south as you're looking to the south wherever you live. Scorpius is like a fish hook. And when you get one of these, and I'm going to show you later on another source where you can just get a free star chart, you got to take some time with it. You got to kind of get into it. You know what I mean? You're just not going to glance at it for five minutes and, and figure it all out. These are uh, like reading a book or instructions. You, once you sit down and figure it out, though, and wrap your head around these star patterns they're showing you, it starts, the magic of the night sky starts to happen. So that band of blue there, that symbolizes the Milky Way. And you turn the, the edge to match the time of night, 8 o'clock at night on August 14th. The sky looks like that. So then when you want to know more, Get you a book at the library. I've had this book probably for 30 years. And there you see it shows you the constellations up close, all the celestial treasures in it. This is actually an American Nature Guide by Ian Ridpath, one of the premier chart makers out there. So, well, we're going to hopefully get some time under the stars. I, we know kids have gone back to school, but maybe you still got a vacation under you. Maybe you're off of work. Uh, uh, or we have the weekends ahead. There's still warm weather uh, to look at the stars. So, well, Marty, we're going to have a little program today about the meteor shower. We'll recap that. My friend Matt Harbison, uh, this is the debris, uh, took this fo composite photo. And that's what astronomers or amateur photographers are doing. They're combining 20 or 30 images together. It's an easy thing to do in a computer program. Uh, it just takes all your pictures and merges them into one scene, like this one that Matt did in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I believe that's at the uh, uh, Fall Creek Falls uh, uh, dark sky site down there. 
south of Chattanooga, Tennessee. So uh, we're going to recap that. Debris of Comet Swift Tuttle. Marty asked me a great question uh, last week on our Stay Star Curious about uh, the tracks that the comets lay down as they orbit the sun. And I think I've got a an easy uh, metaphor or uh, I have a way for you to visualize this here coming up. So, why wow, this debris of our recent Perseid meteor shower came from Swift Tuttle and uh, that orbits the Earth every 150 years or so, not the Earth, the Sun. And uh, so you'll see, kind of figure out why it is that we plow through these. Well, holy cow, I was out on Cocoa Beach, Marty, and would you believe what I saw? No. No. Well, Bill Whiting saw that. He sending me that. Bill Whiting, thank you. Bill's up in Michigan dreaming about Cocoa Beach. Let me get a little bit of stay curious motivation here. Ah. And he shared this Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, uh, concept image of this is what the planet Saturn would look like if it was the distance the moon is. From the earth are 250,000 miles now we're going to ask you to look at that is that fact or fiction all right do you think that's fact or fiction and i'm going to show you a way to use your fingers okay to figure out if that is fact or fiction so stay tuned and stay curious about that Boy, it'd be beautiful it's true wouldn't it or be beautiful to see but is it too big too small hmm well, think about that. But again, I'm going to show you how your one hand, you can figure out if this is fact or fiction. And this is something we're going to start doing. Whoa, ho, ho, there's Hazel. Connie McDaniel there in the center with Selvin Trotter. Uh, Connie's one of our ACE volunteers. Uh, Selvin is on our team here. And they helped us give away a bunch of books and posters, along with a whole bunch of other people at the Sands Space Museum. There is uh, Ann, uh, and, uh, Miklos. Ann Miklos, thank you. I got so many names to remember today, I wanted to write them all down. Ann Miklos, whose artwork is on our walls in our gift shop there. And thank you for supporting the American Space Museum that way. She had, of course, was a shuttle structural engineer. Uh, and there's Brian Lohas on the left, and of course, Jean Wright, the Sew Sister. On the right, and Jean is holding up the advertising for her children's book that another lady helped her author about inspiring uh, everyone, men, uh, little girls and boys, about following their dream. And Jean was involved in the thermal protection system, along with Brian Lohas there. Brian, great to see you there. And he's no stranger to our bank accounts here at the American Space Museum as he regularly buys things at our auctions that we have. The next one will be of space memory will be October 7th. So great to see you two there. And there's another great friend of the museum, Jory Barquette, with her uh, 3D printing. That is her grandson, Isaiah, there, that good-looking man. And uh, she, uh, we have some of her wares here for sale, 3D printing. She was one of the early people to do that. Also, if you recognize Tori, she was part of the Space Dealers uh, Netflix program, which it was kind of like uh, 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 Storage Wars type of thing, where they figured out the value of space things there. So I uh, hope you can continue that down the road, Tori. But she, like Marty, regularly goes out and does some vending for us uh, during the, uh, particularly the crude launches. So thank you, Tori and Isaiah. Great to see you there. And there's the man on the prowl, Julian Leak. okay? And Julian uh, has got a Nikon camera there, so, you know, he's a professional photographer, Marty. Uh, he is your reporter on the Facebook for the local news. He is chasing, literally, the ambulances all over the county, to, and it, it helps out because sometimes you don't know what's going on. Uh, you can't pick up the newspaper and, and find the blotter of the crime to figure out if that who drowned was that a drowning out there at the beach or why were five police cars in front of that house last night julian leak bought this off of us and he's put posted this on facebook uh that he bought this at the uh sands memorabilia museum that is a next shuttle launch uh poster that you see there 
Uh, glad that you have that proudly already in his space cave there, Julian Leak. We're going to have his on, him on the show soon, Marty. There he is. Well, we will be start advertising heavily our November 11th space memorabilia show at the Cocoa Beach Side Hotel. And we know that's Veterans Day, but uh, we'll have a lot of veterans wanting to buy things for veterans, hopefully. So thank you, Ken Habakot Memorabilia. Uh, as one of our first sponsors we're picking up there. So if you're going to be in town, if you want a table, contact me. They'll be 30 bucks, and we'll have just as much fun as we did Saturday at the Sands Museum. And a special shout-out to astronaut Charlie Walker there. All smiles. And on the right, Nick Thomas, the astronaut wrangler. Marty looking there. And Anita Truex is in the middle. We talk about Anita. And there's Hazel again all over our show today. Uh, Connie McDaniel, uh, there we enjoyed a meal with uh, Charlie Walker, gotten to know him and love taking astronauts out for dinner when they allow us to so we can uh, just sort of hang out with them. And and uh, there's two people there, Marty, Nick, Tom Nick uh, Thomas and Charlie Walker. Uh, you just got to throw a few uh, words out on the table and away you go for the conversation, right? Yeah, you're, yeah. you're, 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 yes, yes. Uh, chime in there. What, uh, uh, I wasn't expecting you're not a question. To, oh, I know you're not. I always catch him off guard, but, uh, Marty, we've done a few of these and we're privileged to do that. Uh, it really builds a great relation, but boy, we get to know these astronauts, men and women. Uh, and, uh, and, and what, what have you got to say about that, Marty? Mark, I was writing something down. I didn't hear the question. Well, I was just saying. <laughs> We build a great relationship with these, you know, uh, we love bringing some of our volunteer and other people that don't get out like I do and you do, like Anita in there. And, uh, uh, and how was the, uh, how was the pepper steak, by the way? Well, I've had better. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the company was made up for, you know, with Charlie and Nick and the rest of our crew, I made up for the all you got to do is throw out a word or two, like I said, and they're off and running with a great conversation there. So uh, thank you, Anita Truex, for being part of our team and, and great volunteer there, Connie. And uh, we're, we're having a ball. Well, as long as we're in air conditioning, we're having a ball. Let's put it that way. And boy, is it's been rough on uh, Nick Thomas is talking about 4,000 visitors at the Kennedy Space Center with the temperatures in the high 90s here all over the place. So uh, Karen Conklin, our executive director and our executive producer on this humble little program, uh, sent me an email that was appropriate to point out that NASA has made it official that data confirms what billions of us around the world know. Temperatures in July 2023 was the hottest month ever recorded in human history. And, of course, those records going back to something like 1880, so 140 years when uh, people started really keeping track of this. Uh, so from our uh, NASA administrator, Bill Nelson, he said, In every corner of the country, Americans are right now experiencing firsthand the effects of the climate crisis, underscoring the urgency of President Biden's historic climate agenda, said NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. The science is clear, he said. We must act now to protect our communities and planet. It is the only one we have. And we're going to talk about our planet uh, in respect to uh, the tenuous layer. Uh, where do these meteors burn out by? Where's those cumulus clouds? Where do they lie in our scenario of, of from ground up to outer space? How far up is outer space? Well, here's the hot spot of July, and all those red areas were areas that set records. All right, we didn't set records here, but they certainly did out there in San Antonio. Look at that. San Antonio every day in July but one broke a record up there and my baby sister's up in san angelo texas and they've just been sweltering just as much i've even had 110 degree uh marks up there so it has been brutal uh of course with inflation going on electric bills will be the highest ever uh, parts of south america north america and the arctic peninsula were especially hot 
uh, experiencing increases around seven degrees above average. All right. Overall, July was a half a degree hotter than any in recorded history and two degrees warmer than uh, an, uh, from the 1950s and 1980s, which was a, a kind of a cooling time. Uh, so they're looking at long-term temperature changes over many decades and centuries, typically 30 years is what they look at. And, in, uh, and overall, this has been hotter and hotter. Uh, tens of millions of people have been under heat warnings all July, record-breaking heat. <clears throat> and the five hottest Julys since 1980 have all happened in the last five years. Warm sea records, if you've been paying attention to the news, the, the tropic, the warm Atlantic and Gulf particularly, 90 degrees in the, in the who wants to put dip their toe into that? But here's what's uh, kind of frightening, uh, is uh, NASA's analysis shows especially warm ocean temperatures in the eastern tropical Pacific, evidence of the El Nino that began developing in May 2023. Phenomena such as El Nino and La Nina, which are warm or cool tropical waters in the Ocean Pacific, can contribute a small amount of year-to-year -year variability in global temperatures. Makes sense. The 70% the of the Earth is these heat sinks called water. Uh, so NASA expects to see the biggest impacts of this global heating up of El Nino in February, March, and April next year. So the worst could be yet to come in the form of some record snowfalls and rainfalls and so forth uh, over our winter month. So uh, nothing to uh, scoff at. The data is there. The evidence is there. NASA has been gauging this and space shuttle missions during this 30 decade career also laid the groundwork that we know our climate is changing. How much of that is created by man-made change? Well, we're contributing plenty. Some of it has to do with the sunspot activity that is that is heated up at a cycle that is peaking right now in a 12-year cycle. So we'll talk more about that to help you stay star curious as we talk more backyard astronomy and the weather-related events of space. Super hot though. Bingo! Stars in the sky where do meteors burn up? Where does space begin? Here's a neat little graphic. On the left is the Earth. The troposphere is just the first eight miles of the Earth, okay? Now, you know Mount Everest is the tallest peak that people climb. It's seven miles. You have to have an oxygen mass to go up there. So truly, only about three miles. Just think of three miles from where you live right now. Is that where your grocery store is? Is that where your bank is three miles from where you live? That is the thickness of what is keeping us alive here as human beings and, and animals and plants and so forth on Earth. Very, very small, all right, on our 8,000-mile globe. The stratos But most of the air uh, weather is in the troposphere. Then you have the stratosphere that goes up to about 30 miles. And that's dense enough. That's for meteors. That's for meteoroids are burned up in the atmosphere, and they're called meteorite meteors. And when they hit the ground, they're meteorites. Okay. Then the next area is, is that menopause. I mean, not menopause. Mesosphere. <laughs> Pardon me, Walker. The mesosphere layer. Okay. R rack that back. <laughs> Uh, that's kind of a, a, a real void. There's not much atmosphere up there. It goes up to 50 miles. And at about 100 kilometers or 62 miles is a physicist named Carmen. He decided that that is actually where weightlessness occurs. And there's, there's nothing uh, much uh, there. And that's called the Carmen line after him. And that is the definition for space or 100 kilometers, 62 miles, the suborbital astronauts we call Carmenauts. You get above that, we say that you have experienced weightlessness. Uh, so the space station and space shuttle in its days is up about 200 uh, miles high, all right? The Aurora, uh, now that's showing 330 to 400 kilometers, all right, on a space station on the right. And that's about 200 miles high, two to 250. All right. And the Aurora, 
the burning up of particles from the sun that are streaming off of it and then hit us about three days after they leave the sun's surface and travel 93 million miles. Aurora burn up there. So, yeah, Marty, meteors and aurora are beneath the space station. So, yes, they had alerts over the years of Perseid meteors and other meteor showers, particularly when we knew it was going to be a, a more uh, thickness of the area that we're going to pass through, and you'll understand that in a minute. Another graphic, just to hammer this home, the troposphere where weather is is only 10 miles above the Earth's surface. Okay, that's where all the flying goes, airplanes, the stratosphere just at the edge of that. 31 miles, you're basically into no uh, type of, of breathable molecules, of course. Meteors, though, can burn up in this mesosphere uh, before they hit the stratosphere. Then higher up is the thermosphere, and then exosphere. That is where the moon is in the exosphere. There's still a lot faint, faint, faint traces of atmosphere, even all the way out to the moon type of thing. So, but we're talking several molecules when uh, uh, in, in a square uh, foot of air. All right, so hope that you understand that a little bit as we show you some beautiful pictures from a friend of mine, David Cortner, is up there near Hickory, North Carolina. That's a oh hour or so west of uh, Asheville. Uh, and um, of course, you're fighting the atmosphere uh, in the troposphere. Okay, the clouds. In his picture on the left, yet he got some streaking shots you can barely see in there. On the right, I see a meteor that's just going above the horizon there. He's got a bunch of them in this picture. All right, he combined images, several of them are one frame, but you have to shoot a lot of pictures to get uh, um, some satisfying images of meteors. And you know, Marty, and here's a beautiful one that David Cortner up there uh, near Hickory, North Carolina. Here he's got the beautiful Milky Way, all right, which you can see that with a camera on a tripod, a 30 second exposure with a very high sensitivity ISO like uh, uh, 5000 if you can get up that high uh, but the key is you want your aperture to be wide open to the lowest number like f point f3.5 uh, so you may have to go in your manual setting and set your exposure at 30 seconds and your aperture at f3.5 uh, and then find your uh, self timer because if you push the self timer when you push your finger on on the button that moves the camera and that could jiggle things on a long exposure there so use your self timer to eliminate any hand motion in that camera but a beautiful picture there david cortner up there and we've got uh, a couple other pictures to brag about here Oh, this is, this is a gorgeous one. Wish we could just fill the whole screen with this, Marty. This is over uh, St. Lorec in, in uh, uh, Spain. All right, this is a town in Spain called St. Lawrence is the translation of it. St. Lawrence was a martyr who died there. And in his martyrdom, uh, around uh, when he died around August 10th, these... These uh, meteors were prevalent, and people called the meteor shower Perseids were known as the Tears of St. Lawrence. And this photographer, Juan Carlos Casado, uh, during, uh, took continuous 30-second exposures uh, and then combined 1,200 photos were obtained, each one examining and extracting uh, meteors out of it. So there's dozens of meteors in this. You see where the radiant is. It's like snow falling or rain falling in front of your headlights as a car in a car going down the road. It looks like things are emanating out of a, a radiant in front of you, but it's because you're moving through it. Everything's just coming straight down, and that's what's happening here. Look at that beautiful Milky Way shot. This is a professional astrophotographer to get the city, all of this. This is tedious work. But good job to this gentleman, Juan Carlos Casado. I posted his website. Uh, you'll see it this, this evening on our Facebook page. And uh, just gorgeous, Marty, uh, on there. So hard to top that. And then, But here's what's going on. There's our sun in the middle. 
in the Earth, August 12th on the left. Six months later, it's February. All right. So, Comet Swift-Tuttle goes around the sun once every, I forget, 175 years, I think. So, it last came by in 1992. So, it's not going to be around for a while. All right. But it has laid down in its orbit a bunch of rocks and gravel, so to speak, pieces of it. As it got close to the sun, the sun's energy stripped some of it like like blowing wind, and it is solar wind, we call it, and it strips a comet's tail into gases, and it strips the water particles and rock and so forth fly off of it in another tail, all right? So to think about this, it's laying down a trail all the way around, and then when it comes around, it's passing over that same trail that it left there, all right, and replenishing it, so to speak, as some of that dissipates, some of it is absorbed uh, as it spaces out in, in the solar system, and others it's hit by objects like the Earth. So here's an analogy that you had me think about, Marty, is a gravel truck is the comet. And right up at the gravel coming out of the bottom of the dump truck, that is the tail of the comet, all right, as it speeds away. And the tail of the comet and the dust and the rocks, the dust equating to the gas maybe of the comet and the rocks of it there, they stay right close to the main source, all right, as it's spewed off. But all as this dump truck lays out gravel, that is the uh, around a path that takes 175 years to go around the sun, it comes around again and lays down more, all right? Now, this does dissipate a lot. It's, it's active and it spreads out. But imagine the Earth is down here in this grass, and we're a, um, let's say we're a beetle. We're, we're, a, we're a, a type of insect, and we're trying to get on the other side of the road, all right? It's easier when we're just going across the, the, the dirt, but now you got the gravel to contend with. So it's, if I was an ant or a, a, a beetle or a roach or something that wanted to crawl across, a, a turtle, imagine anything. We're coming from this side. The earth is cutting through this, okay, and going over in the other direction to get on the other side of the dirt. All right, so we're not following behind the truck, the comet. We're intersecting it as shown here. And I, oh, and I appreciate Marty comment about that the other day marty uh but that imagine that that's the truck of gravel and spraying stuff out there yes marty question yeah bill whiting's asking how large is swift tuttle excellent question bill whiting swift tuttle is actually larger than comet halley halley's comet is about 10 miles in diameter and swift tuttle is over 30 miles in diameter both of those are pretty large sizes for comets a lot of comets are a mile or two in diameter uh so uh difference between a comet and an asteroid is the water a comet might be an asteroid that's just got got 50 percent water type of thing but most asteroids don't have water and why they come from the belt between mars and jupiter uh, where there may have been a planet that got destroyed in some point in time maybe there was an earth like planet there that had a nuclear war and blew up everything that is not as far-fetched as you think it could sound but uh, thank you bill whiting for that and bill we're going to share your uh, saturn picture here in a minute that we showed earlier fact or fiction that image of saturn on Cocoa beach stay tuned there but hope you enjoyed that uh, analogy there. Uh, and, well, let's look at these a little closer. I keep saying, Marty, that a meteor is just a grain of sand, all right? And it burns up as friction hits it instantly. And bright ones that might blow up like a bolide that we call this behind me could just be the size of a, a that's not a softball size, I don't think. It could be. Uh, it'd probably have some noise with it, if that. But uh, that's probably no bigger than a marble at the most to make that big burn. So energy, the, the law of conservation of energy, nothing is completely destroyed. It, it turns into another uh, form of, of energy. So the matter of a meteoroid, when it hits the atmosphere as a meteorite, burns up and becomes light. And that light energy, right, 
is green at the top. You can just barely see the green color turn to reddish orange at the bottom left. All right, that's beautiful to see. And then here's a time exposure of the, uh, or a fancy photo shot. They could whirl the camera around to do this. Uh, around Polaris, the North Star, and you see a meteor going through it, and in the middle, it burst. And that that's probably a good size, like a, oh, you know, size of a small little tiny pebble. Uh, but as it hit the Earth's atmosphere, uh, it, it, it burned and then blew up as the gases or water in it burst, and then uh, it faded away. Now, sometimes you see a trail of smoke behind these. So, Hope you got out and enjoyed some meteors over the weekend. Marty, you got any questions about the uh, comets and meteors? Certainly glad you brought that up. No. Good, good. Well, how do you learn about the stars? Once again, we talked about the planetsphere that I had here. Planetsphere, like planet sphere. It's a, a way to find the planets that uh, some of these guides will publish on the back where the planets are, what constellations for a couple years ahead of time. You can buy something like this at your local Books a Million uh, type of a bookstore. And, uh, you know, they're 7 to 12 $15. There's a lot of books, how-to books, the star, introductory stargazing books that have them with it. But uh, you may get a free map off skymaps.org, all right? Uh, in Sky, this is a very every month. This is their home page, uh, free to print out. All right, so I'm promoting them. I will print these out. There you see the night sky on the left. If you want to buy a planet sphere, you can print out two sided sheet. All right, the top one gives you exactly what the sky looks like, and the highlights is happening in the month of August. I forgot to print that out myself, uh, but we just had new moon. All right, it says the moon is near. Spica uh, on the 21st, which is a star in Virgo. All right. Uh, so uh, the, the, the blue band is the Milky Way inside there. There you see Hercules and Pegasus and Andromeda. Uh, I mean, not Andromeda, but Utes, the Big Dipper. And that's, that's the way to learn. All right, is, is if, if, you, whoop, if you got any interest in this. Uh, celestial objects, a good primer. Just a kind of a, a 411, as the younger people say today, about how to stargaze in the backyard. But once again, it's, you know, you got to put some effort into it and get your head wrapped around it and learn the basics. And once you do, it's like riding a bicycle. All right. You'll go out and just look up and have an appreciation of a star pattern and say, oh, that is the northern cross of Cygnus the Swan going down right in the middle of the, this uh, map here. So once in a while, I get lucky. This is uh, last year I was out seeing the uh, uh, Milky Way, which is there on the right, and caught at the top a meteor streaming away from me. Pretty bright. It's got a nice little tail on it there. That one probably because it was coming straight at me more. Uh, see, meteors can be coming straight at you, like zoom like this. Zoom like that, it can come, or it can be coming straight up and down like this one behind me is. All right, so there's a lot of angles. Like I was holding this, imagine this is a meteor streak. Okay, well, this one looks like this, you see a lot of it, but the one I have in the picture in the upper right hand corner there is actually maybe it's, it's more like this coming at me at an angle. We don't see the full length of it like that, using this telescope as an idea of the streak of a light of meteor. So I got a, two planes in there, one in the, the about in the middle on the right, and then at the bottom is another plane there. You can tell by the blinking red lights there. So, fact or fiction? What do you think, Marty? You want to take a, a, a guess? Is, is, uh, thank you, Bill Whiting sent us this. Neil deGrasse Tyson says, if Saturn was put as far away as our moon, 250,000 miles, this is what it would look like. And that looks to me like a beach around here, except for the mountains on the right-hand side. So that's probably more like Hawaii or Peru. <laughs> what do you think, Marty? Well, I think it'd be fact. But I also think that the rings would be cutting through the Earth. Oh, well, the rings would look like that for sure because they're very thin. 
uh, they're coming down through the maybe behind there. But uh, all right, fact or fiction? Well, you can with your hand figure this out. And here's how we're going to do it. Mark Usiak took a picture of the rising moon over the Amish country of Pennsylvania a few months back. And the moon is 2,000 miles in diameter. If you want to uh, quote me on it, it is 2,159 miles in diameter, to be exact. So we know that's a half a degree of sky is covered up by the moon at 250,000 miles away. And I've told you time and time again, that if you hold your little finger out at arm's length, the ratio of humans is the same, whether you're six foot five or four foot five, you're gonna have the same ratio, most normal people. You can cover up the little finger, the moon all the time. In fact, you can way cover it up because the, our, your little finger covers up a half a degree of the sky. So if Saturn, so how much of the, we can figure up if the moon's a half a degree at 2,000 miles in diameter, Saturn is 70,000 miles in diameter, actually 72,367. So 70,000 miles, all right, in diameter. Let's, so if a half a degree is 2,000 miles, let's find out how many half degrees are in 70,000. And two into 70 is 35. So there's 35 one half degree sections of the sky in there. So we divide that 35 by two for a degree and we get 17 and a half degrees of the sky would be covered up with Ju with Saturn if it was as close as the moon. Now, how am I gonna figure that out, Marty? I told you, your little finger extended is one degree. Three fingers held out arm's length is five degrees. That's the distance of the, of the, the, the pointers of the, the Big Dipper. 10 degrees is your fist, all right? 15 degrees is the old rock and roll sign there. And 25 degrees is is uh, hold, holding, I think that's a universal sign for hello too or something. But I my arthritic fingers won't work that well. So if I'm out on the beach, okay, and gonna check this out, fact or fiction, and I kind of visualize my hand, Marty, out there, and my hand out the tip, the tip. We're talking about the ball, all right, would be a fist, more than a fist, because it would be 15 degrees is this, all right? And at 25 degrees, yes, your hand held out would, in fact, be about that spread of the rings in Jupiter and Saturn there. So that's a fact. That would be so cool to go out and, and see it that way. So um, uh, that's a fact, Jack, okay? That is how Jupiter or Saturn would look. And I want to just give you a little astronomy exercise that we do all the time using these ratios of our hands and our mind's eye to how far away are things or apart from each other. We'll say that uh, Mars is uh, five degrees away from the moon tonight. Where you going? That's pretty doggone close when you hold your hand out and it's three fingers. That's five degrees, all right? And 180 degrees is from the one side of the horizon to the other side of the horizon. Circles 360 degrees for those of you that forgot that. So a uh, little bit of an astronomical computation there in our minds to figure out that, wow, that is science fact. So... Marty, thank you for another great Streamlabs show today. In fact, we've got a great week heading up for you. Uh, we have got uh, a guest on Wednesday. Uh, Marty, tell us who our guest's name is there. It's Jeff Andrus. Uh, he worked TPS for uh, Space Shuttle, and he's working at TPS, meaning a, a tile protection system. And he's working with uh, Blue Orbit. No, he's working with SpaceX. Okay. Uh, good. Well, we're uh, uh, looking forward to Jeff being here. And uh, we're going to have the USAC brothers in here with Carlton Bailey on Saturday. And we're going to kind of do a fact or fiction with those three. Marty's working on the questions. He came up with that idea. And we think that'd be a lot of fun. We hope, oh, there's old CB there. He's out. He's got a handful of peanuts. Giving them squirrels are all around him, Marty. I can... I spy CB feeding the squirrels. He's watching today. Neil 1030's out there. Uh, Matteo Margani's watching. Thank you. 
I see Robert Law about to pour himself uh, English beer, I think, at the end of his uh, evening up there in Scotland. And Doug Forrest, what you got there, Doug, in your hand? He's got a, a pencil that's a B-grade pencil. He's sketching another shuttle, Marty. That endeavor of his was so popular there in Los Angeles. Bill Whiting and Dave Stangy, of course, number one fan out there watching, staying curious. Hope you tell your friends what we're doing here to give you space history, astronomy, once a, a month or so, what you can see in your backyard. The moon is making a moon dance again. The crescent phase will be up there. Uh, and uh, then things will start getting washed out by the moonshine. But get out there and, and look at the constellations in the Milky Way. You might not see the Milky Way in your backyard so well, but put, trace out there the Summer Triangle, and we'll talk about that next week. Trace out the uh, the Northern Cross. It's up there, easy to see. And then when you get out to the park over the weekend and it gets dark, you can see the old Milky Way, and you can still see Perseid meteors. We're still going through that meteor storm as that dump truck of a comet still dropping gravel out in its path, and we're still going through some of it. But we went through the, the thickest part of it over the weekend. So hope that you go out and see some shooting stars and make a wish. So on behalf of the America Space Museum and everybody that has volunteered and all of you out there helping us stay curious, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you tomorrow to bridge the space between us. Now let's get out there and have a coffee and see some more meteors, Marty.